Hello and welcome to Analyzing Avatar, the late Airbender podcast with myself and my friend Chris. Go through episodes of Avatar and now Korra one by one to review them. Um, blah, blah, blah. I'm long standing fan. Blah, blah, blah. Chris, new fan. Exciting times. We are at the end of, or heading towards the end of season uh, two of Korra. We are on the episode Darkness Falls, which I believe is the penultimate episode of the series. Uh, for those who don't recall, this is the one where they fight a bit. Um, how you doing, Chris? <laughs> that's my I'm doing recap, good, man. How that's, are you? That's my recap. Yeah, I'm good. I'm good. <laughs> well, they do. I mean, they do fight a bit, don't they? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I think that's look. It, it, I think here we, this is something we have to sort of like accept with the structure of a show like this, right? If they're serializing it more so than Last Airbender. If we're saying this is a sort of, you know, seven hour, six hour movie, whatever this adds up to, or probably less, if you add up all the 22 minute pieces, we're in the, the final act. We would expect, we would expect there to be a chunk of this sort of length that was action based here for the story. Um, so it, it, it's not a criticism. It's just when you do it episodically and you're trying to analyze an episode and you sit down and go, mostly fighting in this one. Uh, <laughs> It does make it harder to review. There's stuff to talk about, though. I've got notes, but yeah, it's uh, structurally and like plot-wise, in terms of like summing up what this one was about. Um, but yeah, they they fight for a bit. <laughs> and yeah, you they, find... they fight, and T- Tenzin and the gang look for look for Janora. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah, that, that's the best part of the episode. We'll we'll come back to that. I, I, I yeah, that that stuff's my that's my favorite stuff in this episode. But let's um let's. Talk generally then. So how how are you feeling after watching this one? Because I assume you just, you just watched it this morning. Yeah, yeah. No, I I, I enjoyed it. Like uh, it's, it's I I thought there was some incredibly uh, well. I thought the moment of him slashing down and just spoilers right from the off we're going in. Um, you know, slashing down rather, mm-hmm. and one by one the previous avatars disappearing. Mm-hmm. Uh, I thought was incredibly harrowing. Um, it, it's interesting, isn't it? Because like, and I don't mean this as a criticism. I'm just thinking out loud. Like, all the jeopardy so far has been on them and the characters and the spirit world. Mm-hmm. We've I- I- if they defeat him next episode, we've only sort of got one episode of Dark Avatar in the real world, which is interesting. We don't even know for sure. They've definitely gone into the real world. Actually, um, we've just seen sort of spirit off. Um, but I thought, I thought it was very tense. Um, I thought it was, um, I thought the action was, was good. Maybe a little, a little generic in places. Um, I thought there were some really love, lovely nods. Obviously we saw Iroh again. We saw, we saw Zhao in the mist. Um, you know, I thought, yeah, it was good. And like you say, there's not, uh, there's not, there's some bits to talk about. There's not, there's not a huge amount to talk about. But I thought I was I was kind of scared is too strong a word, but I was like, oh, fuck, scared, I guess, at the, you know, to use a bigger term than is needed. I was scared at the moment. So I was meant to be scared at. I was. Um, yeah. Mm. Yeah. You, it, you, it's, you, it's so you, funny. You, felt, this, the, you this... felt the threat of the episode is, is I guess, what you. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I absolutely felt the threat of the episode. I think it's an interesting, it's an interesting one. I found here's here's a thought to pick up. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, let's, let's open here. It's, it's such an interesting one because at the end of the episode, as we're sort of seeing all the avatars disappear and stuff, and and Korra is no longer the avatar. In my mind, I was like, guys, is this is this too much exclamation? You know, is it? And I think I used this comparison before, but is it medichlorines? In Star Wars, you know, is it is it are we are we getting too much of a peek of how the Avatar works? And then I went, well, what if we, if it is too much of a peek? What would I have preferred it to be? And I was like, well, you know, some some spiritual stuff. And then I was like, well, this is this is definitely some spiritual stuff. Like it it the explanation absolutely tracks and is and is a genius one. I I guess I guess my question is. Am I actually thinking not so much do I like the explanation, but indeed do we need an explanation? Mm. Is is that the thought? Is that the feeling? Should this have been left unsaid? Yeah. Do we do we need to know? Do we need to know the Jedi Jedi uh, and Medichlorians? If we actually found out the Doctor's name and someone went, here's a family, here's a family tree which explains where Susan fits in. Would we would we want that? You know what I mean? 
Well, I, yeah, I mean, I guess, I guess the, the diff, there's a, there is a, there is a difference though. I guess though, in that, um, are you buttering toast right now? Is that what is that what that noise is? No, sorry, I'm itching my eye again, but I was. Uh... <laughs> My my hand was over the over the mic. Oh, just, just from, it, there were two there were two sounds I was getting. Listeners won't have heard it because of the way we we record this. But I it, it either sounded like someone buttering toast or like just doing some light um, DIY, just sawing up a piece of wood, just <laughs> like <laughs> just just chopping through it a bit a bit, a bit of a two before. You know, it was a bit too long, Chris, for the shelf you're building. <laughs> Hey, I, I I would love a bit of toast right now, but alas, that is not the case. No, right. Shall I just secretly text uh, text Jess and be like, make him some toast? No, she's out. She's out, and we don't have any bread either. You don't so. have any bread? No, we've got two kinds of bread. I'd lend you some bread if I could get if I could get it to you in a quick and efficient manner. Yeah. It was one of those. What are the two types of bread? Well, we've got the classic, you know, your classic white bread, you know, just like a Warburton's or whatever. And yeah. we got a uh, an Irish soda bread. Soda bread, really Ooh, good. Nice. That's what I had for breakfast before I came on here. Very nice. It, it, it was one of those things where we were busy at the weekend. So there was sort of, you know, sometimes if you're busy at the weekend, there's, it, yep. you, you just don't do the shopping. It just doesn't feel like there's, a, it almost right. doesn't feel like there's a need to do the shopping because you're basically out mm-hmm. all weekend. And then it just, for yes. the week's shop, you, you, yeah, you end up behind. Mm. Oh, for anyone uh, wondering, it's it's the brown, it's it's brown soda bread. I should clarify. Mm. It's, not the, it's not the it's not it's not it's not it's not the white soda bread. That that's also very good, but not not what not what I have. Just you know, if people are thinking what what what, what kind, but I answer the question. You know, it's, it's like when people. No, when I, was, I, I, know, I, used, I used to get a lot of questions about what kind of tea I was drinking. You know, I'd talk I was about drinking tea on the podcast. Saying I was glad to know. No, yeah, no, 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 I had to clarify. Yeah. They're two very different things. I, I I like both kinds of soda bread, but I barely even think of them as the same product. Yeah, because the brown one tastes so much different from the white one. Anyway, um, yes. Do so, we need to? Do we need to know the answers? Do we need to know the answers? Yeah, it's an interesting question. I I I think there's a difference though between like the doctor's history and the stuff here because the stuff here has plot r- relevance. Like it's it's. How Cora, in, in, if you're gonna do the spiritual, and as you pointed out, it, it has to. Cora's spirituality is going to come from her position, you know, as the avatar. And how much of the spiritual stuff can you do without starting to explore how her powers work in a more practical way, um, and putting sort of uh, information to it, like, and even even forgetting, like, even saying we don't do the explanation of. Let's let's say we don't do Vatu and Rava and Wan. We don't do that stuff. We're still going to be learning a certain amount about how her powers actually work if we have her doing spirit stuff for a whole season and making the spirit stuff the sort of center of the season. I think it's kind of a little bit unavoidable to to some degree. The what to what degree is you know take your pick. Like yeah, I suppose the the creators absolutely could have uh, you know could have aimed away from giving us answers on some of the bigger stuff so i guess it's really that maybe i'm undermining my own point there when i say that but like i've I, the stuff they gave us is plot they've made it plot relevant and in, in a way they've designed it i think with with the doctor's with the doctor's history i just feel like any plot that would require us to know that stuff or where that stuff would come out in would have to would feel quite contrived as an excuse to do it whereas i feel like mm. What we've got here feels like quite a natural. You know, we have an avatar. We have an avatar that doesn't that doesn't have a, a good uh, grasp on her spiritual side at the start of the season, and she's learned more about the spiritual side of the avatar than any previous avatar. Ang didn't know this stuff. Mm. Well, I, I mean, uh, he did through his you know ancestral knowledge, I guess, of like you know, but he didn't practically. He couldn't have recited the tale of one to soccer and katara you know um if if soccer and katara had said hey ang how did you become the avatar he may he maybe would have been able to connect with one and speak to one the way he spoke to roku and got on that story maybe or maybe in the avatar state he knows that story but he doesn't know it practically um i i you know i think if you're gonna do if you're gonna do it you do it this way i think um in terms of uh, you know, uh, execution of many of the plots in the season, obviously, aside. In terms of just from an idea perspective, if you are going to commit to telling that story and you are going to commit to putting, like, 
uh, you know, uh, practical explanations in for how some of this stuff works, which, as you said, is, is always a risky move. This is probably the way you do it in terms of the idea, the, the conceit. Tie it so heavily to a, to a, to an avatar whose journey needs to be learning about that stuff, um, and and a villain that's tied his evil plan into it too. So it all feels like at least it's it's relevant. And then in terms of giving those answers and giving those explanations, you run the risk of alienating your audience. You always do with that sort of stuff, no matter what. Um, it's 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 it, some people are not going to like the answers they get um but i think you know at a certain point like it, it, it's a little the other difference here i think is this is the original creative team right doctor who has been going for so many years the original creative team are very you know sadly long gone you know they don't have input in the choices that are made now and uh, whereas i feel like when you've got something so singular in its vision like the world of Avatar, where, you know, um, Mikey and Bri Bri, as we've affectionately named them, um, have had control over the main pieces of media that make up the canon of this show. I think it, that's their right to, if they want to explore that stuff, they can. It's not, you know, a show that's been on the air since the 60s, it had been handled by, and, and by doing that, you're robbing other writers of their their ability to keep that stuff a mystery and use the mystery of that to their own advantage. You know, um, there's that other element of it too. Um, maybe this is always what they had in mind for how it happened and how, how Avatar came to be. And that, I mean, and that is, that is what we've had indicated as well, by the way, but this stuff was always in their brains because they, they were going to do, they were going to do something. I think I want to say in season two of the original series relating to like doing a version of one story. I think I think that was the original plan, I, or at least they were going to, you know, cover it in in some sort of maybe not exactly in the way they did it here, where they told the, the the full story and then explored it through the villain the way they've done it here, but like some some version of it, uh, and they ended up saving it for this, and I and I don't begrudge them that. I think yeah, I think I I agree with you in that it's always terrifying, but because it's I don't mind any of these explanations personally. It's always really hard for me to muster that kind of frustration, and also you know we're so we're we're only you know. What seventy odd episodes, eighty episodes into this this universe now? It's not like it's been a, an eternal mystery for a bajillion years. So yeah, I, I, I'm I I don't I don't begrudge that at all. And I think there's some if you're going to reveal stuff about the way it works as well, doing it in action rather than in telling. Like a lot, this, no one in this episode describes what's happening to Cora. We're seeing it happen. We're have seeing it visualized, and that's really cool because we're kind of learning how the Avatar stuff works just through visuals. Um, I do have a small criticism um, because he, he, the minute he fuses with with Vatu, he can bend all the elements. But he he how like he doesn't he has an avatar state of his own right where his eyes go red. But what past version of this new dark avatar is he pulling from to do that? He has yeah, a learn. Everyone else needs to be trained. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, like, 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 Wan had to learn all the elements. Uh, you know, Kyoshi had to learn all the elements. Like, they, they, that's part of the journey of an avatar and should be part of the journey of a dark avatar. And I feel like if you're going to do this plot, what actually should have happened, like, I mean, is, is, is in reality, what you do is you end this series two episodes earlier. So basically last week, but instead of the cliffhanger of last week being Vartu is free, you free Vartu midway through the episode and it ends with the dark avatar created and then running away. <laughs> because they've what, got to... You think they then get some sort of training and stuff? Yeah, so the idea then is we have to stop them before they master their powers. It, it's a reverse of Aang, right? Aang had to... Then you get less master... fighty fight, Dan. Go on, sorry. I said, then you get less fighty fight. No, you still do the fighty fight. You do the fighty fight to free Vatu and have them become the Avatar. But then once they're the Avatar, they have to bail. They immediately bail. And the stakes are, we've lost. There is now a dark Avatar out in the world. And then it becomes a reverse of the Aang situation. Where, like, with Aang had to learn all the elements before... Um, the villain could succeed now for the hero to succeed they have to stop the villain before they can learn all the elements 
That yeah, if you nice. if you're gonna do that idea, that's that. In my opinion, that's how you do it. You have this dark avatar actually be an avatar in the sense of they really have to go do it. You know, I can't remember my exact feelings watching this the first time round, but I've got to imagine the second I saw him doing all of the, the bending, I was like, oh, that's a shame because <laughs> he just knows. I don't know how he just knows or why. Because again, when a when a modern day avatar goes into the avatar state, they can do all the bending even if they've not learned it yet. But that's because they're tapping into their past lives this is the first incarnation of this avatar one couldn't one wants is he gone is he tapping into the spirit though could rather rather and one when they were fused for the first time they were quite strong weren't they they didn't particularly have to learn it but hadn't he in he had to no he didn't do a whole montage of him and rather learning how to do all the elements they oh, did. Yeah, they had, yeah, they had yeah, a whole right, montage of him learning how to do the elements with Rava as a as a companion, like oh. a little, you because know, there was that whole thing about like Rava had to hold on to the bending powers because like, a human could only hold on to one. So fusing with the spirit was the way he gained all four. four but the, the the spirit had to have them, and then he had to train learning how to use them. You know, it, one by one he was taught them. They did it. They did. They did that in the episode. And I just feel like if you're going to do a yeah, dark no, you're actor, right. You're right. I just yeah, it just seemed strange. But it's like maybe okay, maybe that I don't think that's necessarily a bad point in the story. I don't think that's like a net a critic. Well, let me rephrase this: as a criticism, that is more about leaving interesting ideas and plots on the ground instead of picking them up. So that's not a direct criticism of this episode for not doing that. That's a choice, um, and it moves the plot on. But as a viewer, leaves a hole. For me, where I go, well, I would have liked to have seen that. That would have been an interesting thing to have explored. Mm, yeah, no, I agree. I yeah, think, sorry. I think that's I've just really, ranted uh, for a long time. <laughs> so carry on. No, no, no. I think I think that's a good point, and it is a it is a plot hole. Like it is because you're right. They did they did the montage with Rava. So mm-hmm. why is this different? Right. This yeah. This shouldn't be different. I mean, he's already a waterbender, so fine. He can waterbend. I, I, I'm, I'm mm-hmm. you know tick. But how he was just able to fire an airbend and um, earthbend so 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 immediately through me, if I'm being honest. Um. So the the, the one other element of this episode, I really just if we're doing stuff that before we get to the good stuff, because there's plenty of good stuff in this episode, and there'll be a lot for us to talk about that we that we liked, I'm sure. But can we talk about the 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 Cora just like <sighs> this whole oh, I'm not going to be defeated and suddenly I'm going to avatar more and be better at this somehow. There's a bit where like she's he she's he, been thrown in the ground essentially and the ground is closing in on her. Right. And rather like talk rather gives rather gives her a pep talk basically. <laughs> R- Rava's like, hey, she... you can do this. And she's like, oh, yeah, I can. No. And she says, she literally says something like, no, I will not lose and bursts out, right? And she's all like, oh, I'm, you know, I'm, uh, I'm going to stop you, bad guy. I think she bursts out and what she says to... to oh, is it to, to, no, I won't to, lose. Taking a jig is, you can't lose, I think. Or yeah. you can't win or something like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It fucking generic drivel. She just avatars harder to get out because Rava said so. Like just I, that's what Rava says. That's the subtext. Rava's like, "Hey, Cora." She's like, "Yeah." She's like, "You know how you're losing right now?" Yeah. Avatar harder. Okay. <sighs> what? Like it's just it's 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 so unearned. It doesn't do anything. It doesn't tell me anything about anyone. It's just like a weird like, "Oh, here's a moment of peril." Psych. I I have a lot of nice things to say about this episode that we'll get to. I promise. It's there's some really, really incredible, incredible like visuals and artwork and some really creative fighting. I, uh, there's so many things I like about this episode. But while we're in negative Nancy zone, just seriously, what the fuck is that moment? That moment could die in a ditch. Like, just cut it out. And why is it in this episode? Take it out. It doesn't do anything. Such a false peril. It's just like. It's just like somebody like it's it's like somebody got an AI to write that part of the script. <laughs> That's what it's like. It doesn't weirdly I just didn't react either way to that. Like I didn't I didn't I wasn't angry. I equally wasn't pumped. I wasn't like yeah, gone. But 
I just didn't really have a reaction to that because I think because I think it is so generic. Because yeah, it was it just, just like, yeah. It right. just sort of washes over you. Like, oh, that's a thing that happens in TV shows, I think. Like, it's it's like, uh, yeah. it's, it's it's just it, it's just like copy-paste from a thousand other things. But without any meaning. Like, because they sometimes do that in other shows. And they do it with meaning. And they, they, they do it in a moment where the character, like, realizes something about themselves or, you know, whatever. And, and then they, 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 you know, like, uh, uh, the first example that's come to my brain for some reason is like, um, I think they do it in, um, I think they do it in Spider-Man Homecoming. You know, they have him being crushed by the big thing because the, the vulture like dropped a building on him basically. And it's him pushing his way out. But he has a character realization that sort of gives him the strength to do it or whatever. So we're learning a little something about the character, right? It's not just Avatar harder. Like, it's, it's you know what I mean? It's, it's so, there's just nothing to it here. And I'm not saying it needs to be like a massively complex thing, but it's just the same thing we keep coming to this season, which is just that Korra is so often, like, <laughs> directionless as a character. So moments like that fall flat, you know? Then you have, you know, especially when you turn it over, how does Tenzin solve his problem this week, Chris? Well, he he learns something about himself. That's the big difference. I am not a reflection of my father. Yeah. Yeah. He learns to, he learns to accept that and it gives him fog vision and he can see through the fog. Which is sure... Like you know, airbender hard. Oh, that's not, no. I wasn't being facetious. That was just no, me no. But what you're happened. right. That wasn't no, me. No, no. I understand. But you're you're right. Like on paper, you could argue those two things are very similar. But the difference is, though, <laughs> Tenzin gained that ability by learning something about himself. He didn't just think harder about it. Like he literally went, "Here's the specific thing I've 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 gained. I'm Tenzin. I'm myself." He's gotten over a personal hurdle that has allowed him to access spiritual powers he maybe didn't even know he had. And that's great. <laughs> it's so fucking good. It's the best thing in the episode. All the tens and stuff in this episode and this whole season is great. Why does this keep coming up as the consistent thing? Why does the tens in side plot keep being the most interesting thing about episodes this season? And the thing I keep coming back to, other than wobbly and overly complicated plot stuff, muddling things always, it's Cora's lack of a clear character arc. What's Korra's personal struggle? Not practical, not physical struggle. Yes, there's a dark avatar, world at danger, I get that. But what's what obstacle is Korra overcoming in herself? Because the answer to me right now is like, fuck all. <laughs> she wasn't great at spirit stuff. <laughs> and what well, I mean, she wasn't. <laughs> right. <laughs> But why can't her not being good at spirit stuff be connected to maybe her being a bit too headstrong? Yeah. Or, a, you know, or some other quirk of her personality. Ang's, a lot of Ang's stuff was connected to his youth. His, a lot of his struggles were actually that he was, he was probably too young to be doing what he was doing. And it was overcoming that and learning to mature quickly as tragic as that is to see someone have to mature quickly, that was such a compelling story, Fang. What's Cora personally overcoming? And it's the, the answer is fuck all. I mean, that, is that, that was facetious, that question. That was, a, that was a rhetorical question because the answer is nothing. And that makes everything worse. It really does. Because in that, in, that, in that Avatar harder moment, in a season where Cora had a really clear message, that's her I'm not my father moment. I'm not a reflection of my father. I am Tenzin. That's her version of that moment. And it's great in that version of the season where she actually has a fucking character arc and a story <laughs> about what she's personally going through. It's driving me crazy, Chris. <laughs> yeah, I think, it's a, I think it's a really good observation. And I think it kind of applies to... It kind of applies to everyone. Like, obviously, technically... Technically, there's been some story... For for Marco and Marco and Bolin, but mm-hmm. it, it's just been stuff happening to them. We're not mm-hmm. really dealing with how any, either of them feel about any of it. There was a, well, there was, there was a bit of it, but I just, I was like, oh god, are we reversing this love story as well now? Okay, oh, actually, that's yeah. fun. 
I know I said that like, I had a lot of nice things to say, but I don't have anything nice to say about that moment. We'll come back to that. Um, <laughs> but like, like it's just uh, unfortunately, it's just stuff. Apart from Tenzin, everyone else stuff is just happening to them. Right. It's and not. I... It's not that linked to character stuff. Yeah, and I think you can probably get and away with that more that gets... for like side characters. I don't think like every week on you know the original show, Sokka had a big personal demon to defeat in his B plot. You know what I mean? Sometimes the B plot can just be a fun little rompy one, and that's okay. But I think when you're taking the big swings, this show is taking. You need it. I, I don't know. I Sokka trying to find his place in a, in a, in this team where everyone else has powers, right? And working out that that place right. is to be You're right. the general. And Toph it... dealing with Toph dealing with her family's rejection of her and yeah. and what that means and and adapting to 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 be friends. I mean, do we need to go into Zuki Poo's? Arguably the the you know the strongest character arc in the in the whole show. Um, yeah. And and Katara uh, trying to deal with whether she protects or and uh, okay the Katara one I'm I'm stretching a little bit but I still well yeah but, but, uh, but Katara is uh, dealing with the loss of her mother Jay in she she you know, she sees her mother in herself like she she's really conflicted because her mother passed we, away at a young age and now she's mothering this group and that's like a big thing for her so like uh, yeah all of Katara's stuff comes back to that I think and and we deal we deal with it you think about the episode with soccer when he you know all the moon stuff and the moon spirit and all of that sort mm-hmm. of stuff we deal with that we had a plot this year with bolin i think it's bolin bolin the police one yeah no that's marco but yeah go on marco <laughs> marco 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 wants to be a policeman more than anything else he's a, he's detecting he's a detective and nobody believes him nobody believes that he's telling the truth and they all laugh and dismiss him and we don't really ever find out how that makes him feel. He goes to prison. Oh, well, now he's in prison. Now he's, he's, he's so disbelieved. The system that he wants to protect is so corrupt. He's ended up in prison. How does that make him feel? Dunno, he gets let out of prison. Asami well, I, has I, no, just well, lost for a second, part. For a second, Chris, let's be fair. For a second, he probably felt bad. Well, I don't know, man. We didn't see it. Oh, he was in the prison. He looked sad. He had a sad face. Oh, okay, cool. Uh, <laughs> Asami. Asami, I think one of the reasons we get so much, we get so frustrated and feel so much justice, uh, hashtag justice for Asami, is mm. because it's arguably the one interesting element of love triangle bullshit, which is she has been portrayed by everyone in her life. She got betrayed by her father. She's just been betrayed by the business guy. She is constantly getting betrayed. And then she's been betrayed by Bolin, I would say probably, what, 57 times? Uh, Marco, and but yes. It, it's, <laughs> Marco, sorry, 57 <laughs> times. It's one, of the most, it's one of the most interesting threads in the show connected to a character, and we're not dealing with it. We're not even. We're not even. We're barely even seeing her, let alone seeing her deal with that. And when we do see Asami this year, instead of dealing with those interesting plots of our own, it's always in service of Marco or Cora, or like, even, or even uh, Bolin. Actually, ironically, because um, there's that episode when mm. Bolin was sad because Marco w- was still in jail and like he like and, and Ginger had rejected him so he was out on the balcony while the Nuktuk premiere was happening and, and Asami came out and serviced him as a character rather than herself as a character in that moment and there was no discussion about how she felt about any of it it was all about Bolin yeah. this show has done Asami so dirty this the more I've watched this season the more I've been absolutely outraged at how Asami's been treated I can't oh, yeah. tell it's it's yeah. I can't I can't well as you can say I can't tell you, I'm confident i don't i can't think of specific examples but i'm confident asami is handled better going forward um because i there's no way i have fond memories of the character going forward if they continue to be treated like this but i do so then you know i can't pull up specific yeah, but... plot lines in my brain but I, I i i remember feeling better about how asami is channeled later so yeah. yeah, well, I look, I look forward to seeing her fall in love with someone else because that seems to be the main and get into some more love shenanigans because that seems to be the main, if in doubt, with these characters do that. 
Um, so our, our plant a flag now that I'm willing to bet one of the ways they develop that character is another, is another love story with another character that gets complicated. Um, just a bet. Uh, we'll find out if I'm right. Based, I just... based on the first two seasons of this show, it's a reasonably safe bet, isn't it? <laughs> Exactly. I, yeah, I don't. I don't feel like you're exactly re- I, like I. You know, you're ringing up your uh, your accountant, going, "Is this a safe bet?" They're going, "Yeah, you're probably all right, aren't you? <laughs> you could risk some money on this, <laughs> mate." I just, I just had my fucking. It's, it's a cost of living crisis, and our mortgage is covered up. My, <laughs> but there are no safe bets. My account is like you probably should start gambling. Like, <laughs> <get> my. <laughs> uh, how do you feel about yeah. buying a month's worth of lottery tickets with your wages? <laughs> <laughs> um yeah I, I don't know man like i but so i don't think it's just gore is my point i think it's i think it's every character and also like and i know we're only two seasons in and we've only really seen um dodgy rock for a season i know that but think about the fucking character development that zuki poos and actually all the villains had on avatar we don't even know why he wants to do this. No, we, uh, you know. other, other than his vague, the, the, his vague notion that he, he last week he sort of said he didn't feel like the spirit world should have been separated from the physical world and the Avatar shouldn't have done that. Um, and the, you know, and in the earlier parts of the season, he was talking about how you know humanity was a, was, was was negatively affecting the spirits. So our assumption is. He's kind of weirdly on the side of the spirits, mm. but like but even that is we, but vague. We're going, we're, but, but we're going into the finale. Shouldn't we not be making assumptions? Yeah, we you should know. know. I mean? We should know. But we shouldn't just know what he's thinking. We should know why he's thinking it. Why did this guy fall down this well of being so sort of like, you know, uh, mm. l- l- spirit based what's why what is his inv- what's his personal interest in the spirit world why is he so personally affronted by what's happening to them that he's felt the need to make these choices yeah you're right and and and, and, and for one thing i can say with absolute certainty is the villain and or villains that come up in the next two seasons following this one have much much more well-rounded interesting characters and and a much more interesting character with much more interesting perspectives, um, in my opinion, um, and, and are actually properly explored. This season, I honestly, I have been really shocked about this season. I really, really, genuinely thought that people were wrong about this season. Uh-huh. This was often talked about as being the weakest season of the show. And I guess I just, yeah, I guess we, we talked as well about this show, though, having a little trick where if you kind of watch this show casually, a lot of the stuff we're talking about is papered over. Like, like you said, it's, oh, you know what? We found the, per- this, honestly, this chorus scene that we talked about this week, the one where she goes, you know, I'm, you know, no, I will not lose. And she bursts out of the ground and whatever. And she just, av- the, uh, the Avatar's harder scene, as I'm going to now dub it. That scene is a fucking great analogy for this entire season's problem because it's just, it's the beat and the skeleton, the exoskeleton, really, of a, of a thing. But none of the insides are there. So it doesn't really hit. But when I asked you... When I brought this moment up, your response was like, yeah, it didn't really have a negative or a positive opinion. It just sort of washed over me. And I feel like mm-hmm. that's such a great analogy for how this season works in terms of like, if you watch this super casually and you're just like, just put it on. There's a couple of good jokes, some nice, a couple of nice fights. And the story sort of works in that, you know, we have Cora and we have a bad guy and they have, they have opposing plans. They get in each other's way a bit and then they fight. Like it, it's the skeleton of a thing is there. It's just none of the complexity or the heart, or the character work that usually really helps invest a person. But again, if you're watching this super casually, or even in a marathon style, sort of a binge style, you might not necessarily pick up on that. You, you, you maybe you'll feel like it's not your favorite of the seasons, and you won't really know why until you sit down and maybe do an hour podcast for each episode, where you're forced to actually reckon with what this season is. <laughs> 
But it just made, it just made me laugh because all this I've been really disappointed with this season to discover that the sort of thing people say is true because I've always always defended this season and I defend it on the grounds of Ferrex, such a great character and I like all the ideas of the spirit stuff I like the visuals of the spirit stuff I I you know I love the Tenzin plot in this season I really do. Um, there's another element we will talk about next week that I often think of fondly when I think about this season. I'd like the season to be complete before we talk about it because I think it's a it's it's a, it's a, it's a wider implications thing. Um, but this, you know, I always think of this season fondly for those reasons. And yeah, wow, there's some fucking shit writing in this season. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, <sighs> let's talk about. Let's talk. Well, first of all, I'll clarify. I don't. I don't have like an accountant. That, that makes me sound way fancier than I am. I just want to be clear. That was a joke. Um, I don't. Want oh yeah, no, like, I know. We've got an accountant. I assume people assume, huh? know that you. Yeah, I, I assume people know that's a joke. I did. I didn't want people to be like. I didn't want people people to be like. I'm going to stop fucking paying Patreon <laughs> <laughs> if they've yeah. got accountants. Um, God, I, the, I wish uh, I could. I wish I could afford an accountant to tell me when I couldn't couldn't spend money. It'd be great to have someone who's smarter than me <laughs> over my shoulder going, "Yeah, you don't, you can't afford that." <laughs> do you think Lovely. that's a dream? Do you think that? Do you think that and a weekly shop in M and S is or, or Waitrose is like is like the goal? <laughs> Definitely not Waitrose. Um, uh, I, I, you know, for me, I don't know, this is just psychological, purely psychological. For those who don't know, Waitrose is a brand of supermarket in the UK. In the UK, we have a really, we have an, we have a weird thing. We have a class system that a lot of countries don't have, where we really do define like working class, middle class, like you know, that we we have really strict def- definitions. Waitrose to me will always just be the store that Tories shop at, and I know that's not true, and I know, I know that's not true, but there's just something about it. <laughs> that screams like Bellens shop there, <laughs> like just the you know the fucking assholes who inherited daddy's money and daddy's business, and you know maybe probably went probably went to Eton, you know probably know Boris, you know personally. Uh, that's the supermarket they go to. I don't know why that is yeah, in my head. Fair. Oh, and I you say go to, real... they don't go to. They either send someone to go to it, or they 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 you know they do it through a card or whatever. Um, but still, you also have a real hatred of Sainsbury's, don't you? Yes, but that's just because they're incompetently run. That's you know the stores are dirty, the staff are rude, they, they they're deeply disorganised, the prices are awful. I, yeah, I don't care for Sainsbury's, but that's just because like it's just a bad product. <laughs> Sainsbury's another supermarket in this country. I think I, I guess I guess I, I guess I'm I'm a Tesco's guy. I guess that, but there's never a Tesco's near wherever I've lived, which is frustrating. I've always ended up having to go to Sainsbury's, which has led to this real disdain for Sainsbury's because I've been they've been forced upon me by proximity. Do you think it's possible then that? Do you think it's possible that that's just supermarkets and you you just happen to live near a Sainsbury's? No, because I because I've because I had in the past and you, you know within you know within sort of the last ten years I've lived near Tesco's and preferred it. Um, but okay. my, unfortunately, my last two flats have been near Sainsbury's, and I wish they weren't. Mm. Uh, one of my flats was near an ASDA. That was all right. Didn't mind ASDA. ASDA, are you, we uh, we don't live near an ASDA, and I would like to live near an ASDA. I, I think ASDA's all right. Yeah, yeah, I, I, it's, I had no complaints when I lived near an Asda. Whereas I live yeah. near Sainsbury's now, and um, I feel unbridled rage regularly. <laughs> like, it's so such moving, a horrible moving store. Aw- moving away from the the rage of the episode and uh, and the and supermarkets, what did what did you like? Tell me what you liked, Dan. Yes, well, I mean, obviously the the main the, the main thing you were going to we will talk about for that is I, I everything in the spirit world for Tenzin and their, those guys the whole fog of lost souls. There's this whole subplot for those who don't recall it. Tenzin's looking for Jinora. They um, have a series of scenes where they're sort of lost in the spirit world, getting like sort of like comedically lost in it in ways that are funny. Like they they there's this big spider spirit they disturb. It's all going um, a bit wrong. And then, um, where does he get the clue from? He finally... Oh, yeah, he meets Iroh. The, oh, yeah, they like so, so nice. Tenzin, um, Bumi, and Kaya bump into Spirit Iroh, who remembers them from, I guess, when they were children, which is really sweet and a really nice moment. And he gives them a little a little verbal clue that helps Tenzin... He doesn't give Tenzin the answer. He lets Tenzin work it out himself, which I think is really very Iroh, but also really smart from a story perspective because... You know, if, if a spirit of a dead person shows up and goes, it's over here, and then they go over there and it's there, it's not very engaging. Um, so 
<laughs> There's a little bit of a clue Iro leaves in his words that he then tends in kind of puts together with something that the, uh, that Spider Spirit said earlier. They eventually find out where Jinora went, and it's a place called the Fog of Lost Souls. And it's basically if a human ends up in the spirit world and is trapped there. There's like a spirit that takes the form of a fog, and it basically it's a prison to keep all the humans from just being loose in the spirit world where it drives them mad and they're imprisoned just by their own madness they don't run away they're not scared because they've just gone insane where we meet when when Tenzin goes there to rescue Jinora we meet Zhao for the first time since season one of this show god I love this so much so for those who don't remember Zhao Zhao the conqueror Zhao the destroyer of the moon whatever nonsense he was yelling um, was the villain from the very first season of this show, um, kind of Zuko's rival um, Fire Nation army guy that was the one who killed the Moon Spirit um, to allow the uh, Fire Nation to overrun the Northern Water Tribe. And then, in the end, he was being sucked down out of anger by the spirits, and someone held out their hand... And because he's a prideful man, he refused it, and he got sucked down into the spirit world. And we never saw what happened to him. We just know his pride was was his ultimate downfall. It was a brilliant, brilliant character arc. It was a piece of shit character, but like a, the best kind of piece of shit character. And we get to see his fate here. He was lost in the fog of lost souls this whole time, just going mad on his own ego and his own power. And that is weirdly satisfying to know that that's where he's been for the last, like, 100 years. <laughs> Um, and we find um, we find Jinora there. We have the incredible moment we already talked about, where Tenzin uh, meets his father, or at least imagines his father, because we know he's potentially being affected by the spirit and going a little bit insane himself. But either way, it teaches him that he shouldn't be chasing the image of his father. He should be his own man. And in that moment, he Tenzin's his way out of it. Tends in harder. He tends in harder. And um, the fog vanishes and the people come to and uh, Kaya, Bumi and, and Tenzin and um, Jinora um, leave. It's 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 a perfect B-plot. It's executed brilliantly. We learn something about Tenzin. We get a really cool cameo from the original series. It's visually interesting. It's kind of haunting to think that a, a spirit that gets loose in the physical world you know, is a problem, but is dealt with by being sort of returned. You know, I guess by, you know, Benders can like, well, well, actually, we don't really know. I guess they just fight them, don't they? I get, well, Unalok was kind of calming them, but they're certainly not imprisoned, whereas humans that fall into the spirit world are treated somewhat poorly. Because um, not everyone in there will have deserved it, like Zhao, that's for sure. Um, it's incredible. What a great section of the episode and some brilliant storytelling I, I felt really passionately that this is like the best thing in this episode but also like some of the best stuff this season has offered so far what a great conclusion to that Tenzin plot that we've been sort of bubbling up throughout the entire season about his his own lack of being a spiritual leader and having to face that to save his daughter ah so good so good yeah I'd like to see I'd like to see the next bit of that I'd like to see that acknowledged with Janora. I'd like to see a moment between the two of them right. um, that, that, that seals that properly. Um, but yeah, I agree. It's, it's also like an example, I think, of a perfect cameo where, you know, if you don't, if you haven't seen Avatar, that's just, it's just a spirit. It's just an example of a spirit gone crazy and you right. don't need to know the details. They don't do it too much. I don't know how far you are with a certain other show, Dan, but I think a certain other show that we're both currently watching is is doing the remember this person a little bit too much, um, or, even though I love it every time. Um, Wait, what? You I, might not know what I mean by I, that. I don't off the top of my head. What's the show? Okay. Huh? Can you not tell me the show? Would you, would you, I can, but it will it will it won't spoil any. It won't spoil the plot of the show at all, but it will spoil some it will uh in, you you might end up looking out for things but i can tell you if you want yeah i think you're gonna have to just because i'm so confused as to what you're referring to 
the the after party is doing oh. a thing where characters from series one keep popping up for like it, like this basically uh, they keep popping up for like a minute uh, like 30 to 60 seconds where they're just randomly there and then they go that's brilliant okay yeah i, I i've watched three or four episodes of that now no th- just three just three i've just seen three so okay yeah very good um that's fun uh, but yeah i think you're right though that's a good way to do it though i think f- from cora's perspective like if you're watching this show and you didn't watch avatar the last airbender which would be, be an odd thing to do i think but like if you did choose to just put cora on with that avatar i think you are reasonably catered for here in the you know the Zhao mm-hmm. stuff it's it, you don't feel like like he's just an example of a crazy person in this it's not a it's not essential to the story. You you know his back his backstory and his history, and they've done that already this season. If you remember when they went down to Wan Shi Tong's library in the spirit world, and the 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 professor character that led Ang and the gang back to that library back in season two of the original show, and was left there as it descended into the spirit world, his skeleton was found. You know, by Junora a handful of yes, episodes yeah, ago. Yeah, do you remember? And like that was like. Again, a perfect reference where if you didn't know who that was, you know, it's it's Wan Shi Tong pointing out that the last guy that spent a lot of time in the in the library died there, you know, and you, you, that's all you need to know. You know, he's the context of that is is, is evident. You know, it, it, it's, it's, it's the show presents enough information for it to feel like it's but it, telling you something about what's happening right now without it feeling like a, an overt wink. But I think that, that you do that by tying it to the story, though, right? Like, if, if, if Zhao had just showed up, in one of these episodes while he'd been in the spirit world and was just there. And they're like, oh, this is where you've been this whole time. He's like, Maha! and then he gets like punted away by a spirit or whatever. You'd be like, what was that about? <laughs> but like, because they've tied it, like they've used him as the demonstration of what happens to people in the fog of lost souls. He's got a purpose in the story of his own that's unique to this episode. And therefore, if you don't know who he is, you just go, well, that's, that was his purpose. He was there to teach me about how mad this place can drive you. You know, the same way that the skeleton was to show you about the the, the dangers of, you know, the, or, or, or at least the obsessive nature of the, the information gathering with the library. You know, this guy was in that library so long he died there. You know, like, fine. Like, that. see, they, they, it feels like they serve a purpose within the context of the story they're in. They're not just like, let's take a minute out to show you this person. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Mm, very good. Um, so yeah, yeah Zhao the really, Conqueror, really Zhao the Moon, Moon Slayer. What, what, sort of stuff, what, what stuff did you like about this episode? Because we do still have one big complaint, and I, I want to get the good stuff out of the way before we get to the one big, or my other big complaint. I think I kind of, we've kind of talked about everything I really liked, to be honest with you, I think. Is there anything, could you think of anything we've not covered that was really positive? Um, I really like some of the comedy in this episode. We had a little bit of a Boomy and a Kaya double act going on beginning of the episode. Thought that was very funny. I liked seeing those two trying to navigate in the spirit world in their own weird ways that were both very them, but also very amusing. Yeah. Um, I liked it when... Yeah, they... I enjoyed, I, I, I did <laughs> enjoy, there were spirits everywhere. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I also really like, um, we've passed this mushroom already. That's not the same mushroom. Yes, I am. <laughs> <laughs> talking mushroom which is genius really funny um because it's that old gag isn't it of like i'm sure we've already been past this tree if the tree could talk the tree could confirm that <laughs> so like it's just the idea that in the spirit world that's possible um i like um I, I actually quite like the initial conceit of this episode as well actually we haven't really talked about that in terms of the, the cora situation the conceit of the episode is the big cliffhanger from last week was that vatu escaped but that's not the whole plan. The rest of the plan is that Vartu needs to merge with um, Unalog. So this episode starts with Korra punting Unalog through a portal and telling Marco and Bolin to go through and keep him on the other side of it. So Korra immediately makes a really smart, strategic decision to keep the two separate. That doesn't last because, you know, um, using his kids, uh, Unalog outwits and catches out Marco and Bolin and gets past them and ends up getting in but like that's a really good like practical just sort of set up for the episodes like sort of more more physical stakes like what are we trying to achieve here we're stopping these two things from beco- from getting to each other one's on this side of the portal one's on the other and there's a hero on each side trying to fend their side of the portal 
perfect. Like, really good, logical. I understand where everyone is. I understand what everyone's individual little goals are within the context of this battle. Great. Really good. And then the use of Vesca and Desna, which we'll come back to because there's a negative element of that at the end. But um, having using those two to sort of catch uh, Marco and Bolin out. Oh, ah, yes, beautiful. All that stuff's great. And the fights, they're all really good. There's so many cool visuals in this episode. Lots of really interesting use of... Well, yeah, there's a reasonable amount of interesting use of bending. There's a, I mean, there's a lot of just fire throwing the element at the other person, for sure. Um, but there's the, you know, there's there's people being frozen in place and some other stuff like that. And like, there's a lot of interesting visuals because the world, because they're fighting in the spirit world, gives it a lot of an interesting um, visual element. Um, what else? I swear I had more notes than this. Uh, we've already talked about that. You're right. We have talked about a lot of these. Oh man, maybe I'm right. Maybe even if you're right, sir, maybe we have already covered most of the good stuff in this episode. Oh, did you have any? Okay, so we 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 hint we talked about this moment, but I really want your thoughts on this. What did you take it to physically mean? So we 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 have that towards the end when Cora is being essentially defeated, that moment where every blow makes a, a visual representation of a previous avatar sort of dust like fade away. Mm. What do you think that's indicating visually is happening? Like, what do you th- what do you take from that moment? I'm very curious. E- your either thoughts. two things: Rather is being destroyed, and she's uh, you know her memories, her uh, her connections with those avatars are mm-hmm. are being destroyed one by one, or the piece of them that lives through Rava and is able to communicate with the current avatar through Rava, through the spirit, are slowly being destroyed one by one. Mm. I think it was basically it, ultimately destroying her. Right. Or, yeah. You know, all the she, as she's merged with them, their spirits have, have made her stronger and become her spirit, and slowly, one by one, they're getting destroyed. Yeah. See, isn't that, isn't that incredible? Like, what visual storytelling that is? Because... Yeah, it's brilliant. No like one, say, ex- no one explains like, it's, that. It's harrowing. Mm. No one needs to. Eh, I reckon next episode there'll probably be an over explanation for it. <laughs> but yes, I, I agree. I I agree. In that moment, we don't need, and 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 that's what makes it so harrowing. That's what makes it so threatening. Yeah, yeah, I would agree. I would agree. Um. So well, let me see. Then with that in mind, let's to what I. I feel like I said at some point in this episode, there's plenty of good stuff. We'll talk about all that. But I've got complaints. I've got one more big complaint, and I just want to make sure I do all the good stuff before we get to that. But I feel like we are running out of good stuff, so maybe I'm going to have to talk about the other thing I don't like. <laughs> all right, let's let's do let's do Bolin and 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 and, and as uh, Eska. Um, fucking awful. Everything about this, I hate. I hate it so much, Chris. I cannot tell you. Um, so the thing that happens that I like is the twins are the ones that stop Marco and Bolin, right? And they, they stop them by freezing them in place. That's a tick. Fine. Because then you have the opportunity for the two sets of characters to, to have a chat. The two sets of siblings can have a little conversation. And I think what would happen here in a competently written show, Chris, is we'd build on the doubts we've already seeded in Esker and Desna, and we'd have them go look, this ain't right. There's there's evil going on here, and you know it. Let us go. You don't have to actually... We're not asking you to fight your own dad, but let us go. And then we build on what we've already witnessed. You know? And they even have the line in the script. It's like it was just there out of reach. Where, like, Eska does say, well, oh, Father did, you know, nearly sacrifice you when we were in the spirit world that time. But then they just fucking ruin yeah, it's it. It's not even that. It's 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 not even that. He he says it. I think. And, well, does he? No, maybe you are right. Maybe it is her. Yeah. Um, one second. Let's should we, should we bring it up? No, I think you are right. No, I think you're right. Yeah, but it, there is so there is a line that gets dangerously close. Um, to to doing the thing that they they that they, they should have. Here you go. Yeah, 
Desna, father was... Yeah, no, you were right. De- to Eska, Desna, uh, father was going to let me expire when we tried to open the northern portal. Perhaps we should rethink our position. And then Eska, in a weird switch of character, because last week it was Desna that was all like, no, 100% behind dad all the way. And it was Eska you felt had concerns. This week, just the other way around, because they've either gotten the names mixed up in the scripting process or some other thing has happened. But basically, it's Eska that says, no, don't listen to him. His words are poisoning your mind. And then we have the... I'm just going to take my glasses off. Rub my eyes a little bit in frustration. (laughs) Then we have a scene where Bolin eloquently expresses a deep love that he still feels for Eska, a character that he never really seemed to love in the first place. Um, just sort of was in a weird relationship. He kind of fancied her and then it was a weird relationship and he didn't, he didn't know how to get out of it. Pretty much immediately wanted to get out of that relationship. And it's this heartfelt, he's teary, he's sad, and then Eska lets him out on that grounds rather than the actual established reasons that we've done. For why they would let that 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 they would let them go, they let them go for that reason, and then it's, just, it's so frustrating. This is such bad writing. Marco says the obvious thing because it's the thing we're all thinking when they do let them go, which is something like, in fact, it'll be right in front of me because I've got the thing, isn't it? Um, that was the best acting I've ever seen. You completely fooled her. And then Bolin, all teary and sad. Yeah, right. That, that, that was acting. And then wipes away a tear. What are you trying to fucking do with this scene? What, 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 what is happening with this scene? Because either, right, Bolin finally learns how to act, right? Or Bolin genuinely still has feelings for SK, even though he never had them in the first place. But also... Yeah, Bolin genuinely... Genu- Bolin, what the scene is trying to tell us is that the woman he simply lusted after and then got scared of, he actually has feelings for. But, but Chris, why? Why? Why do that? I don't know. Why? Why do any of this? <laughs> it wound me up. It wound me up because because I'm like, oh god, are we are we reaching towards a redemption arc where they do the right thing and then they laid the groundwork for they're that together? They laid the groundwork for it's it, Chris. Good. Huh? They laid the groundwork. That's why it's so frustrating. If they'd never laid any groundwork for a turn for that for the for the twins for for Esker and Desna, I would go like, all right, you've got to come up with something as a reason for them to suddenly let Mako and Bolin go, right? And make it the connection with Bolin. That's fine, I guess, right? But it's it, it's even more the frustrating knowing that we've laid the groundwork for them to betray their father and then just not used it. You know what, Chris? I'm going to spend and millions that, of pounds building And then that's building not a... the thing that works. What was that, sorry? And then, and then that's not the thing that ultimately works. Yeah. yeah. Like, oh, I'm just going to go build a big old train track. What are you going to do with it, Dan? Nothing. I'm not going to put any trains on it. Why would I do that? That's silly. I just like the look of a train track. It's, like, it's infuriating, Chris. It's oh. such bad writing on every level. And it writes them into a corner again because now we have, okay, so you're either committing to that then and going forward, Bolin still has feelings for Eska, or you're going to drop it like it, like a... Like a well, like you've dropped so many things in this series quickly and without much fanfare, and it'll just never be mentioned again. Either one is bad, though. I don't think either one is satisfying from a storytelling perspective. I don't know what we learned about Bolin. I don't know why we did it that way. I don't know why we wasted precious minutes of this show on that. Did they think it was funny? Because it's not funny. It's not, it's not no. funny. I, mate, I, <laughs> I completely agree. I'm so... I was so like, ugh, with that moment. Because it's... It, and, <coughs> and the thing is, maybe there's a world. If we saw... If they didn't just play these two characters for comedy, maybe there's a world in which he's been living a fantasy and he wants to turn to the only thing that he feels was real. 
but that's not how they played the relationship and the story between these two characters. No. He was terrified of her, and it was played for comedy. So why now is it being played suddenly for for emotive needs for 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 drama? Because it's it's not those things. <laughs> because it never was. That's not that's not I'm... what we saw. It's it's hard to believe the two halves of this episode are written by the same people, isn't it? When you've got the incredible symmetry of Tenzin's story with his daughter who has been more spiritual than him and his struggles with this image he has of his father that he's aspiring to be and then actually learning this season that his father wasn't actually that great a father and who Tenzin is Tenzin's a father maybe in a way that his dad his own dad wasn't and he's going to be there for his daughter in a way his own dad wasn't and he overcomes this desire to become his own father and saves his daughter in the process, maybe surpassing his own father in a, in a way, not maybe as a spiritual leader, but in his own way, right? By loving his kids just that fucking much. How was that written by the same person as this? Because <laughs> this is just drivel. <laughs> this is meaningless drivel. I don't understand. Who wrote this episode? Where are you? Let's 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 name name and shame. Josh Joshua Hamilton. Right, Mr. Hamilton. Um what what happened here? <laughs> How are these two things in the same piece of writing? One is so yeah. good and one is I so don't bad. Disagree. <laughs> I don't disagree. Don't understand. I don't know. I don't know, Chris. Yeah, you you're right. You're right. It's 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 infuriating. And I'm just like, where is it going to go? Because if they suddenly try and make that the plot that they should be together, it's awful. If it was just this moment and that's that's the only point it ever comes up and there's no acknowledgement later or resolution, also awful. Yeah, there's right? literally no good... See. That's why this is such an annoying piece of writing as well because literally no outcome of this now is good. They've written themselves into a position... Mm where neither outcome would be satisfying. Either you're going back on a relationship that we already handled and was had, a, had its purpose and was funny for those moments but has been moved on from, or you're committing to it, or you're sort of undoing what Bolin says. So yeah, you're either undoing Bolin's heartfelt, yeah, sure, it was acting, wipes away a tear because it wasn't acting at all, or you're committing to it and then you're stuck with that. Uh, neither option's good. Why didn't we, if you're going to do this, just leave it at, Mako being like, that's the best acting you've ever done. Because I would have probably, without that last bit from Bolin, genuinely, I might have gone, I don't love it, because we've already established a reason for them to betray their father, but that is kind of funny that Bolin finally learned how to act in this last episode. I don't think that would have bothered me so much. I know, but even that's broken, because then you just go, wow, it's very manipulative for Bolin. What a shitty thing to do to profess your love to someone when you don't feel it. Oh, Christ. Yeah, I don't know. Um, anyway, yeah, it's bad. That's bad. Um, very quickly, the ending, Chris. Um, how are you feeling about the setup for next season? So we have, you know, ten, uh, you know, 100,000 years of darkness begins and Jinora sort of sensing Korra's need for help has sort of turned in that direction. Everyone's coming together. Um, we have a big giant monster version of sort of Vatu slash Unalak. Big red, big red lobster man looking like he's going to Cause some havoc. How are we feeling about the finale based on that ending? You know, it's a bit weird, actually, Daniel, because mm. I, it's a great cliffhanger. Um, I think it's an interesting cliffhanger. I kind of, I kind of would be more excited if this happened two episodes ago. Yeah. You know, given given how quickly things got wrapped up, and you know, we're talking very specifically. I know about the last few minutes and the montage and the sort of. Cora's got her powers back and the the sort of boat suicide murder. But given how quickly everything suddenly wrapped up last year at the season one finale, I think there's so much potential and so much to explore in this cliffhanger that, you know, I wish we had a Avatar season four style four parter dealing with it. The notion of one episode yeah, 22 it's minutes. It's going to potentially... Huh? Sorry. Yeah, 22 20 minutes. minutes. Yeah. Yeah, so it's not extended or anything. That's 
scary. <laughs> If I'm honest, I would have rather... I think there's so much interesting potential here. Right. I'd have preferred that to be... I'd have preferred this to be the cliffhanger of, of season two. Like, this is the final episode. Or this right. is episode 10 and there's still another four. Right. Yeah, I would agree. Because I think like, so many interesting things happening. Like, when he's like a big red lobster man at the end, I, my first thought was genuinely... This is interesting because, like, I'm not sure this is what Unalok got into this for. I, mean, I think Unalok thought maybe he was just going to be an avatar like you know human form but with with those powers i'm not sure this was his was was part of the deal being a big great lobster man big leg like, spirit lobster man with all these tendrils and stuff does has he been tricked Make, oh, makes sense for th- this this universe's version of essentially the devil i guess vatu sort of is an evil spirit like the the the, the, the mother of all evil spirits you know like this is this is kind of their version of the devil um i'd I buy him lying to get what he wanted yeah you'll be a dark version of the avatar but really it's just he needed to be freed and he needed form um so he took the essentially the guy's body but we're never going to get to 20 minutes is not enough time to explore that as a scenario as interesting as it is So, no, yeah. it's definitely not. Yeah. But 100,000 years of darkness is beginning, Chris. You know the stakes I, are I'm high because this is a big number. Be done. I'm, given that season three is still called The Legend of Korra and not The Legend of Alice, and it's someone from, you know, 10,000 years' time, I don't think there's going to be 10,000 years of darkness. No. Okay. Well, maybe, maybe, ne- maybe next season is called Legend of Unalok and it's just about him as a dark avatar. <laughs> Based on la- based on last season's finale, Dan, I'm expecting about roughly 18 minutes of darkness. Really? No. Yeah. Note that down. <laughs> One second. 18 minutes of darkness. We'll see. <laughs> oh, unless there's a time jump, which is possible, but yeah, still. Oh, God, no. that'd be even worse if there's a time <laughs> jump. I love it. Um, anyway, yeah. So, because um, wait, 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 wait. The re- the reason I say that is because I want to. I want. I want Janeiro and uh, um, and Tenzin to have a conversation. I want to see yeah. Cora wake up. I want. I want to deal with. As much as I don't like it, I'd be even more annoyed at us not dealing with the Marco Bolin stuff. Like, so the notion of a time jump and us not getting that kind of stuff. It is also really annoying. So, <laughs> yeah, if there's a time jump and I'm wrong with my predictions of 18 minutes of darkness, I'm still going to be unhappy. <laughs> you can't win here. <laughs> no. Um, I really can't. Yeah, no, I agree with you. And it is, it is. It, I mean, even when I was like a defender of this season, I, I always thought it was paced kind of poorly. Um, you know, I, I, that was always my contention was, yeah, the pacing's not great. Um, but that's... That's a reoccurring theme across the first two seasons of this show, I think. Um, um, something I do think, again, they ad- I, and I don't want to put too much in season three and four, but I really do feel like season three and four really figure it out. Um, it's just occurred to me that to yeah, say... Well, you, it's just occurred to me that to you say... Also, go on. You also felt that season two wasn't as bad as everyone else said, so... Uh, me yeah, for and trusting I, you don't. And I, that's absolutely fair. I was, I, I, I was wrong. I was wrong. Um, it's just occurred to me as well. There's an episode in season four where, to save budget, they had to do a they, they, there's a clip show. I don't know what we're going to do with that in terms of reviewing it. Oh god, we're going to have to review it. We're absolutely going to have to review it. Yeah, I guess we review a clip show. Yeah, I didn't even think about that. It's it it, it it it's it's a shame because it's one of those things where basically just budget wise to make sure they had enough money to do the final they wanted, they needed to do a cheap episode somewhere in the middle. So they they do a little, like almost like a, a version of a clip show episode, um, a sort of cheap cheap version of it. Yeah, 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 we'll see. It's it's there. It's a it's an interesting take on it. it. It's not quite as clever as the Ember Island players as a way to sort of cheaply recap the story before the end. But it's um, it's kind of season four's equivalent to that. But we'll we'll come to it when we get there. Anyway, right. Um, let's let's move on. So, in 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 summary, there is some good stuff in this episode. There are some cool visuals. Um, seeing the spirits entangle and come out and all that stuff is all really, really visually exciting to see. Um, and the Tenzin stuff is just gold top to bottom. There's just, you know, 
the issues that have been creeping in this whole season are very present throughout this whole episode um in the way it's paying off stuff it, it, you know they're, they're paying the price for choices made earlier in the season basically here um in many ways and then bad choices made here too see the bowling scene but um yeah anyway um let's do this should we trip it up chris let's trip it up <laughs> that was a very enthusiastic one chris really wants to finish this episode uh, i'll give you no no, no no sorry <laughs> wait, wait was right. that sarcasm was that was that not so? What, no, no, that was very. That, that was a partic- no, that was a particularly enthusiastic one. I just thought that was you being like, "We're at the end." Whoop whoop! <laughs> I can go soon. <laughs> no, I can go eat some toast. <laughs> no, no, I haven't got any toast, Dan. We've established this. Oh shit! Yeah, that was the problem. The problem wasn't that you didn't have access to it. it the problem was you literally don't have any in the house. I recall. Mm. Sorry, I thought it was just that you need you needed a minute to go make some. Um, anyway. Right. On November the 15th, 2013, Cora Nation, which is, I guess, some sort of fan club thing that Nickelodeon ran, challenged fans um, to reblog a short video posted by Janet Varney, the voice of Cora, on the Cora Nation Tumblr 10,000 times. They had 12 hours to do it. If they did it, the finale, Darkness Falls and Light in the Dark, both episodes would be made available on Nick dot com at midnight that very same night what a bonkers thing to do that's ridiculous i oh. always i i fear like and like it's such a risky move dude. you've got to know you're going to achieve the goal and also the logistics of putting an episode out at midnight that's got to be a well we're doing that regardless thing surely like that's mad yeah, well, so much about this is mad. So the, the episode was due to air on November twenty second. Um, I assume with its with its second part, light in the dark. Let me just check that. Actually, let me just verify. Yeah. So the two part finale was due to air November twenty second. Right. This is November fifteenth that they're doing this, and therefore midnight that night would technically be November sixteenth. Obviously, would be the official then release date of the episode. That's. Several days before it's broadcast, you're just going to put it out on the internet, your finale? I get this That's for mad. the first episode of a season as a thing. Oh, you want to see the, 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 the opening episode of the season early? We'll do a fan engagement thing, and then you get the episode early, and it'll create buzz, and it's only the first episode. And people who watch that will then be committed to the rest of the season, likely, if it's good, right? You know, it's the same reason um, Adult Swim put the first episode of My Adventures of Superman on youtube for free because they were just like people will watch it then they'll come watch it the rest of the series with us we you know we're confident in the show to do that for the finale is fucking batshit crazy um do you want to know if they succeeded they had 12 hours for yeah. ten thousand reblogs yeah, absolutely yeah they did it in two hours um <laughs> they did it in two hours so the episodes did indeed get unlocked that very night um madness <laughs> mad yeah that's so weird that's super weird yeah and i think it's the start of nickelodeon making some odd sh- choices for this show's broadcast which we'll come to in later seasons um yeah this, this is a very this show is just plagued with weird shit going on around it but yeah um based on the information given in this episode it seems that they've uh, iroh last saw ang and katara's children in the year 131 AG, which means when Ang was 41. So, cool. Oh no, 40, cool. you mean 43. Sorry. Yeah, 43, I believe, if I've done the math right on that. Um, when storyboarding the Eska and Bolin kiss, the production crew, uh, crew originally had Eska lick Bolin before kissing him. Um, I think that's kind of funny. Bit gross, but very Eska. <laughs> Don't know why that was taken out. Yeah, I'd have been okay with it. I'd have been okay with it. <laughs> that's kind of funny. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not against that. It's weird and it's gross. I'm not saying that's a thing people should do, but I think for that character, that's Can a I- funny moment. <laughs> Can I give you a joy? And I want you to do that. I want you to commit to doing this today, right, Dan? Can I give you a piece of joy today? Please. Because we watched something, loved it, and I guarantee, like me, you've not really ever gone back to clips of it. So speaking of someone just randomly licking the other person, 
would you do me a favor and take 10 minutes out of your day to go on YouTube and watch the best bits highlights of the Bross documentary? Because I don't know about you, but I forgot just how incredible some of the sound bites from that were, including you know, a scene where one of the brothers is just randomly licking the other one's you know ear. What, and I encourage anyone to do that. It's uh, phenomenal. Uh, yeah, but I mean, I'm not sure I ever actually saw that documentary. <laughs> I think we reviewed it for the podcast. I'm sure I, we did. I don't think we did. Yeah, I'm sure we did, didn't we? If we didn't, then you categorically need to watch that documentary. I don't... I'm not sure I saw that documentary. I don't think we reviewed it. I maybe think you talked about it. Maybe you recommended it, but I don't think we reviewed it as a full review on the podcast. Oh, well, in that case, you, you need to you need to watch that documentary. It's insane. It's fun. It's I, remember, I remember you saying that at the time. Maybe it was one of those episodes... We've done this once or twice where we've split the reviews where one of us has reviewed something that only one of us has watched. We've only done it a couple of times. Hmm. I'm just trying to see. So it came out in late 2018. I'll, I'll keep looking into that to see whether it's listed as something we reviewed, reviewed, or. And if it's not, then yeah, I guess I. Because it, because it, because if it I is there, it. then I've watched it and forgotten. But I really, really strongly feel like I don't think I've. Ever, I remember wanting to watch it. I remember rec- you recommending it, and I remember I remember being interested in it, but I just never don't think I ever got a chance to actually see it. Um. Oh, in that case, I uh, you know, um, yeah, maybe not, maybe not. In that case, you need to watch that documentary. When, when did it come out? Did you say? Uh, two thousand and eighteen, like late twenty eighteen or early twenty eighteen. Uh, it, late. It was aired on British telly over uh, November and Christmas two thousand and eighteen. Yeah, no, we didn't review it. It's not here. Wow, in that in that case, Dan, you got to watch. It's so funny. It's and and like yeah, the the best bits just reminded me how crazy that documentary is. There you go. Um, so if you've seen that documentary, Chris's recommendation to all of you out there listening has to do with that. If you haven't, check that documentary out. The Bross documentary, oh, spelled B R O S S. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm. Um, Here we go. So do you want to do you want to hear? Uh, just, uh, sorry, you keep going, and then I'll uh, I'll give you I'll give you some quotes from it. Uh, so uh, Brian Knitsko enlisted um, animator uh, or no painter I should say Emily Tetri to paint the cosmic background that was layered behind the um, sort of procession of avatars as both of them share a passion for astronomy um, that is the last piece of trivia Chris um, so before we do feedback from last series I, I, are we going to do bros quotes you know, do, shall I not just hear the quotes when they're said in the show when I watch it no, just to kind of encourage you to watch it. So basically, it's a genuine version of like this is Spinal Tap is how people have compared it to. So it's basically about uh, Bross, the boy band from the eighties, uh, reuniting. But like, it's not a mockumentary. It's not scripted. This is just like real things they're saying. But there's so much like David Brent esque style quotes and stuff in it. So here's here's one for you. Rome wasn't built in a day, and fuck me, that's true. But we don't have the time that Rome had. <laughs> the best the best toy the best toy we had growing up was a dart not a dartboard just a dart and now you can't even play conkers in england (laughs) honestly honestly you gotta you gotta watch it there we go that sounds good (laughs) um right so um it's time for feedback from well okay this week oh hold on can i give you one more because this is amazing can i give you one more yeah, sure. I'm just, uh, I'm just worried that like, I made a conscious... I'm worried I'm hearing all the best bits, but go on. <laughs> so, yeah, the spider one. I made a conscious decision because of Stevie Wonder not to be superstitious. <laughs> <laughs> I told you that's the wrong moment to take a sip of my drink then, didn't I? <laughs> that's very good. So, yeah, uh, that's funny. Go. Check it out. Um, so, this one's a feedback from this series, Chris. Feedback from this series. Bring us in. Let's do it. Feedback from last series. This series. Okay. 
Hi, I'm Dan. Welcome to Feedback from the Series. Um, if anyone wonders, by the way, why I say, Hi, I'm Dan. Welcome to Feedback from the Series. We used to do a podcast called Fringe Observers, where we did a quote of the week, and Chris would sing a song at the beginning of that, that segment. You you know, varying lengths. Usually a similar, though, like, vibe every week, where it'd be like, you know, some sort of musical interlude, then it would be Dan's quote of the week. And Chris would get mad if I just went into it without saying, Hi, I'm Dan. I'm welcome to Quote of the Week. Like, Chris legitimately got mad at me. Whenever I didn't do mm. that, um, so I, you know, uh, old habits die hard. I guess he beat that into me. So uh, for anyone wondering, that's why I do that. Um, that's an old podcast, but it's uh, it's still available if anyone's interested. Um, so this is this comes from uh, Hudson Stange. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. Hudson's Stange. No, Hudson Stange six seven six seven. Uh, this is a YouTube comment, and it says, I have a question I'm hoping you can answer on this podcast. When, what do you guys think about the possibility of wood bending and bone bending, both being branches of earth bending? Both could be possible because bones have minerals in them, um, the major ones uh, being uh, calcium and phosphorus in a, f- uh, in a form called, in a, in a form of salt called hydrox, I mean, hydrox pan, pan- Apathy, I can't pronounce that, but yes, science word. And wood obviously also has earth in it. Um, this interests me, and I'm interested in your views. So first of all, ten points on the science and the and the research. Um, respect the the choice to actually like check what minerals are in bones. Um, I think it. I don't think the show will ever go for it on either front. For two reasons i think bone bending would be even grimmer than blood bending and i'm not sure they're gonna go that they would ever go that route but also it is quite similar to blood bending do you want to do the same beat twice storyline wise a morally questionable form of bending that controls another human potentially or moves another human's body um the other reason being we had to just explain you had to, in your own description all of the the science element of the minerals that are in bones them having to explain that in the show i feel like would probably take more effort than it would be worth for the game um on the table anyway, wood bending i'm less confident that wouldn't show up at some point I, I feel like bone bending is like a just just on the beat that it would be on the on the grounds that it would be too similar to to blood bending i think would just never really happen on that grounds purely um Wood bending, maybe. I don't know, Chris. What do you What do you think? Either of those sound like they'd be thing they'd, they'd they'd have. I think I, I I don't think the explanation thing is a problem because they managed to explain it with metal bending, and it is as simple as they share minerals with earth. So I, I think I think that's fine. Um, I think you know they've we've had explanations that took longer for blood bending and uh, metal bending, and it mm-hmm. was fine. Um, I. I think wood bending would be fun. I agree with you about bone bending. Although, as a more permanent, you know, bending someone's bone out of shape and then them being basically... Like, it's interesting, isn't it? How, despite the fact that these bending... Bending can, and I guess, you know, to some degree it's a children's TV show, but all bending can cause permanent damage and it rarely does. (laughs) So, like, I almost think bone bending would oddly be exciting because you know you could bend someone's bone so it snaps and then they can't arguably then they can't do any bending themselves that's quite like a horrifying idea but it almost breaks the rules of the show because no one ever used blood bending but blood bending to to strangle well, i suppose we saw hints of it but do you, do you know what i mean like bending is so rarely used i, I guess fundamentally to to kill Yes. Um, yeah, yeah. So, so it's rarely used lethally, despite the fact that, in theory, throwing a giant rock or a big ball of fire at someone should be lethal. Um, it almost never is in yeah, this show. So, it, so, so if you take away the lethal element, then bone bending really isn't, unfortunately, that much different to blood bending. Because if you if you can't do the lethal thing of you know snapping someone's bones and leaving them there or whatever, uh, paralyzing someone essentially, or breaking an arm or breaking mm-hmm. a body part, breaking a limb. If you can't do those things, then you're just making the body move, which is which is incredibly similar yeah. to blood bending. And, the, and theoretically, oddly, oddly that seems less chilling. Theoretically, that kind of bone bending would be unbeatable. Like no matter what bending you bring to that person to try and defeat them, they just crush all your bones and you'd fall down. Mm. Yeah, 
Yeah, exactly. Yeah, but you know, bloodbending itself has been seen to be fairly unbeatable. Um, and then um, woodbending is woodbending. Woodbending is a fun idea, but I, I think I think unfortunately, uh, as much as I would like to see it, it's very similar to metal bending in terms of making something move. The world has now got quite industrial, therefore, you know, wood isn't as prevalent as much as something like metal. And I think the concern would be where do you draw the line? Because then suddenly, you know, you know, if you if you're able to move wood and metal, most inanimate objects you're able to then move. Do you know? Do you know what I mean? Um, and you know, arguably. Well, if a wood is sat on top of the earth, you can just move the earth and move the wood. But so I get that actually, you know, saying <coughs> most elements would be able to move isn't really a valid argument when that's mm. probably the case anyway. But um, I don't know if it lessens it somewhat. It's like, you know, the, one of my biggest issues with um, like CW-esque superhero shows is, you know, you get a power and you get a power and you get a power. And eventually it's just not interesting because everyone's got powers. Um, and I think, you know, to some degree, I really like the science and the logic of both of those suggestions, but I don't know if to some degree wood would become, well, where do we, where do we draw the line? And, and especially, and also it's, it's, it's like, like we say it, it, because it's a children's show or because they want to add tension or, or whatever, already we don't see bending used <laughs> to the horrific measures it would actually be used in reality. <laughs> and I think the more, the more you're able to bend, the more it highlights that. Well, you know, why didn't he just <laughs> pick up the wood yeah. and knock him out or, or whatever? Yeah, I think you're right. I think I think bone bending is a is a is a sort of like a, 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 a for me like a like an almost categorical. I just don't think they'll ever do it because of. I think you're right. I think the most interesting version of that is a version so lethal. It, it it just wouldn't end up in this show and in this world. I mean, maybe in like a book or like you know something that's a little bit more like. So I, I could see them doing it maybe in like a in like you know like a like one of those Kyoshi spinoff books or whatever. Though those, those were pretty brutal in terms of really gore, hard to read. Not hard to read, but like there's some re- some really gory stuff, especially towards the end of the first book. Um, so yeah, you know those books maybe would go a little harder. They're aimed at a slightly more adult audience. But I don't think the show would ever do that. But wood bending, I could see them doing. Um, in terms of setting, I mean, yeah, we, we we've we've been we've we've been very Republic City based in this show, um, and then the Spirit World based this year. But I could see a season of this show where they're out in the in back in nature again. I don't think that's out of the realms of possibility. Nature still exists. Um, you know, we 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 like the like the time when we met the swamp benders or the sand benders. I could see us going out and meeting wood benders. Mm. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, I don't, I don't think wood bending is out of the possibility. I just, but I don't know what it. I don't, I, I you know, I, I, it'd have to be. They'd have to have an interesting reason to use that, though. I think they'd have to, they'd have to have some sort of like. I don't know what I'm thinking. Like, because we, because when they were bending the plants in the swamp bending, it's because the plants contained water. You know, those swamp benders were bending the water in the plants. Wood being a rigid object, if I, you know, it would ha- the bending of that would have to work a little bit like the bending of metal. But wood is more brittle. Wood like splinters. So yeah, I don't, you have to think of an interesting way to visually depict it. But if they had a reason to, I couldn't. I, I wouldn't rule it out. <laughs> um. So yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that's fair. Good question. Great question. Thank you, Hudson Stain. Mm, brilliant question. Um, thank you. Anyone who wants to leave feedback, you can do so. YouTube.com slash nothing but static UK. You can go over there and put a comment in under any of the analyzing avatar videos. And uh, we may get back to it in feedback from last series, next series. Because um, if you're hearing this, then this series is very much recorded. And therefore, you have to wait for next series. But uh, we, as we've proven this year we'll we'll if we if we can do a comment per episode we can get through quite a lot of the back catalogue of sort of like people's comments and stuff and give them a moment and a chance to respond to them um so yeah yeah it's been fun i think it was a, a good addition for sure mm, yeah so if yeah feedback um that via that you can also do it through the patreon but to uh, through, through the discord sorry i should say but the discord is accessible through the patreon so patreon.com slash nothing but static for as little as one dollar a month you get access to our discord server where you can also leave feedback and comments and interact with us but also um 
we have the exclusive uh, Nothing But Lyrics podcast, which we should have one per month. The, this month's one is late from the point of us recording this. We're recording this in uh, August. But the first two or three went up very timely. So I'm hoping to get back on that um, time, in a timely fashion. Um, and we'll have to put out two quite close in succession to sort of make that work. But we will. We, that's that's the plan. Um, but that's our podcast where we make fun. It's exclusive to the Patreon. It's a podcast where we, where we make fun of the lyrics of old songs or try to decipher them in some cases. Um, sorry, there's just a big bang and I'm trying to figure out what that was. <laughs> okay. I'm not sure. I thought it was the door going, maybe, or something. I don't know. Something slammed. Um, anyway, um, the other benefit to joining us on the Patreon is, of course, access to this podcast and our other podcast rewind reviews one week ahead of release. So, yeah, patreon.com slash the static UK. As little as $1 a month supports what we do. If you'd like to support us in a non financial way, keep listening. That helps. Tell a friend. You can do that too. Um, you can also re- interact with our podcast on any of the platforms that we have. So, you can review it, you can like it, subscribe to it, all that jazz on your podcast platform of choice. And that tells the algorithm you liked it and makes the algorithm more likely to share it with others. Um, I think. That is all the stuff. Oh, no. Uh, mail at Nothing But Static as well if you've got thoughts. You can also send it to us that way. We don't do Twitter anymore, so apologies. Um, and, of course, go support Rafa. R-A-P-H-O. And then Rafa Draws is usually helpful. Well, but Rafa Draws drew the artwork of Apparat Sunset. We use for this very podcast. It's very good. We like it. Um, go support Rafa. You can, buy, you can buy all sorts of merch and things with Rafa's artwork on it. Or at least just go follow them on Instagram. Instagram.com slash Rafa Draws. Um, just go follow them on there and see some of their artwork. Yeah, fantastic artwork. Some really, Ooh. really great stuff. Let me have a look. What they got on there right now? Ooh, I like this one. When's this from? Well, a little while ago, but it's um. I don't, who, who, uh, this is so. This is related to some thing that I don't know, like some anime that I don't watch. But it's a really cool art. Some guy with a red cape in like a deserty. So the Star Wars-y kind of background, backdrop, it's like a big moon. Oh, that's, that's good. That's good. I, I don't know what it is, but I like I like it. Oh, they did a, oh, they did a bit of Wednesday fan art as well. When Wednesday came out, Wednesday playing the, uh, um, what was it, the double bass. Very cool. Yeah, go support Rafa. Nice. Oh, every time I go on this, yeah, absolutely. Scene, I always see stuff that I like. Yeah, there's some really, really great stuff. Mm-hmm. Right, so that's everything for this week. Um, are you excited for the final, Chris? I'm pumped, man. I'm, I'm well. I'm nervous because, like I say, I think there's way too much to wrap up in 22 minutes, um, and I, I don't. I think the promise of this cliffhanger warrants more than yep. 22 minutes. But yeah, let's 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 see what happens. Let's see what happens. All right, so that's everything for this week. I've been Dan Doolan. I've been Chris Billings. and we'll see you in a week's time when we sit down to review. Light in the dark. <laughs>